Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us today for our next interview in the Women in STEM Science Speaker Series. Every Wednesday from now through September 30th, we'll introduce you to some inspiring female role models who are doing incredible work in a variety of STEM fields. This, this series is supported by the Association of Science and Technology Centers, and if then, through a gender equity grant, which supports projects aimed at increasing the representation of women and gender minorities in STEM. I'm Angelica. I am an early childhood science educator at Carnegie Science Center. And today I am so excited to be talking with Liz Engler Shirazi, a research assistant professor at West Virginia University's Department of Neuroscience. Hi, Liz. Thanks so much for joining me today. Hey there. Thank you so much for having me. It's an absolute privilege to be here. And I just want to give a shout out to the If Then group as well for facilitating this opportunity. For sure. And today's a very special day because it's Dr. Liz's birthday. So happy birthday. Um, thanks again for being here with us. Um, I know you have some social media accounts um, that you like to give a shout out to. So if you'd like to go ahead and do that. Yeah, I think for anybody on, on the chat today, I want to encourage you to continue to engage. Um, and, and if this is of interest to you, definitely reach out, uh, take a screenshot, tag me in it, uh, tweet anything. Um, I'm, I'm open to communication. So feel free to engage with me in any platform that, that works for you. Um, and I'm happy to happy to answer any further questions you have. I respond to at sciencesliz.ec uh, on Twitter and Instagram and also at Liz's lab. Fantastic, thanks again. Um, so I have a few questions prepared to get our conversation started. Um, but for all of you watching live, we're encouraging you to ask questions of your own. So feel free to leave a comment um, and we will try to answer those later on. Um, so just to jump us off, um, Dr. Liz, if you wouldn't mind giving us a little insight on your background and how you got started in your career. Absolutely. Uh, so I grew up in Southern California. I spent a lot of time surfing at the beach. That was one of my favorite things to do. Um, and like many people, I got my start in science by participating in the, the school science fair. And I did a couple of experiments uh, that, that were interesting. Uh, some, some worked out well, some didn't, but that's okay. Uh, and that's, that's how I got hooked on this, this topic. Um, for, for my undergraduate studies, I went to Arizona State University in Tempe, Arizona. So I moved about seven hours away uh, to the desert, which I love. And I loved it so much that I continued my studies uh, through graduate school to earn my PhD in psychology with an emphasis in behavioral neuroscience. So that's, that's a part of psychology that really focuses on how our brain controls everything that we think and do. Um, and then uh, about seven years ago, I moved to West Virginia, uh, which was really different than, than California and the desert and really far. Um, and that's where I started my postdoctoral fellowship. So after you earn your PhD, uh, to, most scientists take what's called a postdoctoral fellowship where they get extra training and learn new skills while simultaneously bringing the skills that they've developed. To, to a new lab and everybody is better for that. And so I, I did that for several years and now uh, was promoted into a, an assistant professorship role at that, at that department. Fantastic, um, so inspirational and it means a lot to have someone else here with a degree in psychology. That's what my degree is in. Um, and I, I just love that, you know, it, you're highlighting that psychology is a form of science and that we're doing awesome stuff in the STEM, the STEM field. So. Thank you for that. Um, if you wouldn't mind telling us a little bit too about some of your mentorships um, and anyone who has inspired you um, in your career. Sure thing. So, um, you know, something that maybe is not well known about science is that this is a team effort and to get people to uh, a place of expertise, it takes a lot of years of training and you need a lot of help along the way. So I absolutely have mentors who have gotten me to this point. I'll highlight uh, my graduate mentor, Dr. Heather Bamonte Nelson at Arizona State. Uh, she trained me in learning about how the brain ages and how hormones like estrogens can affect the way our brain works, which was really an exciting area of research for me. 
Uh, she is super passionate about that field and has a ton of drive and you can't help her but get excited for what she's working on. So that was that was what got me going uh, in that field. And then I also want to give an absolute shout out to Dr. Jim Simpkins, uh, who uh, is my post or was my postdoc mentor and still is a career guide now um, as at West Virginia University. Um, and then I'll mention too, one of my grants that supports my research is all about mentoring. And so I've broadened my mentoring network even from there. Uh, where I, I have mentors all over the country who are guiding me in understanding the type of questions that I want to ask and how to go about doing those the best way possible. Fantastic. It definitely takes a team, uh, you know, to learn and get you where you need to be. So thank you so much for sharing all of those wonderful folks with us. Um, something that stood out to me in your bio is that for your science, you've traveled the world and, um, I'd love for you to expand on that a little bit and tell me about that. Sure. Um, science is one of these really cool careers where travel is a big part of it. And the reason for that is that there are scientists all over the world doing really interesting and innovative work. And there's really something to sitting down and talking with them, picking their brain and trying to understand what they're discovering and, and what their next steps and thoughts for the field are. And so... Uh, whether it be for a conference presentation or uh, a, a talk that I'm giving about my research or a workshop that I'm attending to learn about a new type of science. Um, I've gotten to travel quite extensively, which is great because I absolutely love it. Um, so places that I've been uh, in recent years have included uh, like San Diego, which is always lovely, Los Angeles, Chicago was great, DC, New York, um, just to mention a few within the United States, but also internationally. Uh, so I've been uh, many places like in Western Europe, Austria, Switzerland, Italy, um, and it's a great opportunity to travel for your job, eat some great food, experience a new culture, uh, and just get outside your comfort zone a little bit while you're learning. For sure. I love that. I haven't traveled a lot personally, but I would love to. Uh, so just hearing um, that you've experienced science in many places and it's helped you um, is very inspirational and fantastic. So thanks for sharing that as well. Um, going on with more hobbies and fun things that you do, um, I know you're big into roller derby. Uh, so if you, like, if you would like to tell us a little bit about that, I'd love to know more. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, it's definitely become a passion of mine. I, I found it later in life uh, than, than earlier. Um, so I started roller derby about two and a half years ago as a bit of a hobby, uh, a way to burn off some steam and get some exercise in an, a non-traditional way. And it's quickly become uh, a very consuming passion that I spend a lot of time on. Now, the past few months, uh, the derby establishment has taken a step back given the current pandemic situations and the risk to, to public health. Uh, so we aren't practicing in the full capacity that I think most of us would like to, but um, really enjoyable experience. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know the way it works just at a high level is there's five people per team on a track at one time. One person from each team can score points if they pass the skaters on the other team. And the other skaters, the other four, are trying to help their teammates score points. That teammate is called a jammer. Uh, and then those, those blockers, in addition to trying to help their jammer, are trying to stop the other jammer. So that's generally how roller derby works. It's a full contact sport, again, on roller skates, which is extra tricky. Um, and one thing that I wasn't expecting when I first started this, uh, almost as a bucket list type experience, was how many parallels that there would be between my roller derby journey and my scientific career. Um, so that's been a really fun way of seeing my science uh, in, a, in a new light. For sure, that's fantastic. I, as a kid, loved to roller skate, um, but obviously just for fun and just kind of a casual weekend thing. Um, but it's so interesting hearing about um, like the competition side of it and kind of how you had to use science to, uh, you know, really work your way through the track and uh, get some points. So thank you so much for sharing that. Um, I know you said that you might be able to take us on a tour of your lab. 
Um, and I think kind of a little glimpse in the day in a life of you and what you do in your career would be fantastic if you'd like to share with us. Sure, let me, let me take you for a short walk. Okay. Okay, so this, this is the building I'm working in. Oh, before I step out, I'm gonna grab my mask since it's a public space. Okay. All right, so you can see that um, there are offices along the wall and then we have a series of cubicles for the trainees and, and students who work with us um, to help advance our projects. And the cool thing about that is that that makes it a very open environment for communication. So we talk about what we're doing a lot because science can be hard and you need to talk to your friends to understand maybe what, what you're seeing in your data or find better ways of doing things. Um, so I've entered the, the space where most of our work gets done. So I'll do a quick turn around. Um, you can see we have a series of what we call bays where our lab benches are contained and they extend all the way down this nice long building. So again, each bay has different equipment, um, different people work at different spaces. And uh, it's great because it really supports a very collaborative environment. So we're always in the lab together. We're talking about what we're doing. We're asking questions and trying to figure out how to get the best data uh, that we can to answer the experimental questions that we're posing. Um, so let's see. So yeah, that's, that's the space. Fantastic. Okay. Um, maybe if you could expand a little bit about the research you do um, and just kind of give our, our viewers a little, a little glimpse and taste of exactly what your job is there. Sure thing. So what I'm particularly interested in is exploring how the brain and the immune system uh, interact. Now that is kind of a novel area of research. Um, for, because for a long time, scientists thought that the brain and the peripheral immune system, so the immune system in the rest of your body, uh, and the immune system being what keeps you healthy in case you get infected with a germ, or in case you get injured, uh, that we thought for a long time that these, these two systems didn't work together, that they, they seldom even communicated, uh, you know, if you caught a flu, you know, your body was doing something to, to counteract that, but your brain didn't know or care. Uh, and your brain had its own immune system that was separate from the rest of the body. And, and we're learning now as more and more evidence emerges in the past 15 to 20 years that that's not entirely true. In fact, the brain and the immune system communicate a lot and they sometimes cooperate and, and work together but other times that, that cooperation can go awry and they might even fight. And that can have some pretty devastating consequences for uh, particularly where I'm interested in our mental health. And so I'm trying to understand how we respond to stress, how the brain is in charge of that and how the immune system might help or hinder that process. Nice, uh, great research, super interesting. Um, I think, you know, especially with, with what is going on now today in the world, um, that your research and your findings will be fantastic. Uh, so thank you so much for doing that. Um, and thanks again for sharing uh, with us your lab. Um, looks like we have a few questions from Facebook and some of our friends. Um, so let's see. Um, what are some current projects that you're working on? Um, great question. So one, uh, one area of the immune system that I am particularly interested in is um, what's called the B lymphocyte. So the B lymphocyte is a part of the immune system that's uh, called the adaptive immune system. There are two parts to your immune system. There's the innate immune response and the adaptive immune response. So let's say, let's say you stub your toe and get a cut and that cut gets infected. In the, the seconds to minutes after you stub your toe and uh, a bacteria enters that cut, 
the immune system mobilizes a very rapid response uh, of cells and little protein molecules that signal to the rest of the body. Uh, and that happens very quickly. That's part of the innate immune response. And that's good because for the most part, the innate immune response can knock out a potential infection at the very early stages before it's had a chance to grow uh, and cause you know, some more harm to the body. Um, the other part of the innate immune system that's really good is those signaling molecules go call for help to other parts of the body and they activate a very specific response pattern um, that is the adaptive immune system. And that system has two main components, T cells or T lymphocytes and B cells. T cells are kind of, they're the exciting cells of the adaptive immune system. They're uh, very specific for whatever particular bacteria is encountered. Uh, unlike the innate system that just says something bad happened, let's go get rid of it. The T cell says, this bacteria has infected us, I'm going to go do something about it. And, and they migrate to the site of infection. And they're exciting because they pretty much gobble up whatever bacteria has infected cells um, and, and get rid of those sick cells that are not going to do what they need to do. Now the B lymphocytes also get activated. And these are important for secreting our antibodies, among some other things that they do. But they secrete antibodies. And so I'm trying to understand, uh, and it's, it's not well known yet, what antibody secreting cells like B cells are doing inside the brain. Uh, so when we get stressed out, what happens? Um, and so I'm looking at the immune organs that hold, up, hold on to our B cells. I'm looking at where B cells go once we get stressed out by something that's happened and what they do once they get there. That's a really great question and I'm happy to elaborate more specifically if someone wants to follow up. Sure, wow, so interesting. Um, yeah, that's mind blowing, fantastic work. Um, we also had a question that uh, folks wanted to know, kind of what does a normal day in your job look like? So we've seen your lab, we know what you're doing, um, but like, what is just a normal day? Are you at your desk sometimes doing paperwork and computer work? Are you in the lab most of the time? Um, could you elaborate on that a little bit? Definitely. Um, and I think the, the answer is somewhat cliche. There, there are very few normal days in, in science because you're always doing a new project or things are changing a lot. Um, but I will, I will explain why that's, that's still the right answer. It it's also really depends on what stage you are at your career. So when I was just starting out, I pretty much lived in the lab. I was doing experiments. I was looking at brain slices underneath a microscope. I was mixing chemicals together and seeing how uh, reactions were taking place. I was, I was doing a lot of that type of work uh, every single day. And as I gained those skills and gained understanding in that field, my job transitioned a little bit. So now I still do some work in the lab, don't get me wrong, that's, that's the fun part. But my job as I transition into a lab leader rather than a trainee is to do some paperwork, right? So I gotta, I gotta file uh, forms to make sure that we are doing our, our work as safely as we can do it. Um, I'm gotta make sure that we have the money and the resources that are necessary. So. I write a lot of grants these days, and I read a lot of papers. Uh, I, I place a lot of orders uh, for, for making sure we have the supplies. And then uh, another big part of my job now is training the next generation of scientists. So that whether that's next to somebody at the bench as they learn how to do their experiments, or talking with them about the, the types of questions that we need to be asking, um, a lot more of my job has become teaching and, and support for others doing the actual fun part. So I'm, I'm happy to make that transition um, and, and I think it's an important one. And then the last part of my job that I'm really excited about is going out into the community and getting other people excited about science and, and teaching them about the brain. And, and I'll mention that I... Um, did not learn about psychology or neuroscience until I was a, a second year student in uh, college. And that's, 
that's real shame because it's a really cool area. And so one of my goals is to get out into the community, get to see students in their classrooms at, from pretty young ages and teach them about how cool the brain is and get them excited about that particular topic as well. So it's a cool job, lots going on all the time. Um, and again, never, never a dull moment, never a same day. For sure. Um, I love that you mentioned going out to the community and getting other folks excited about science and what you do. I feel like at the Science Center, that's big for us as well. You know, we want to be a place where people of all ages can come and learn about science and get excited and to see folks doing these science careers. Um, so that's fantastic. Um, I had a question myself, actually. So um, you said you have moved into a role where you're more of a teacher. Um, so are you teaching classes like in a college, typical college setting, or are you strictly just helping folks in the lab who already have some experience? Great, great question. So um, a typical faculty member at a university will generally teach uh, a couple of classes. They'll also be running their research lab and they'll be serving the university in some way. Um, and so their, their role is somewhat split. My role is a little bit special because uh, I get to focus probably 90% of my effort on science, which, which is cool. Uh, and I do, I do a little bit of teaching, but I would say what I'm doing right now is um, some guest lectures here and there. Um, although I, I used to teach as a graduate student quite a lot and I absolutely love being in front of a classroom and helping students uh, facilitate their own knowledge. Um, and I think that that's a really fun part of, of being a scientist is getting to teach classes. So I, I do a little bit of it, probably not as much as I would like at this, at this point, but that's gonna change in the future for sure. Awesome, great to hear. Um, also, we had a question about if you had any advice or anything that you would like to encourage girls and women who are thinking about going into a STEM career. Absolutely. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of advice out there to be had. Uh, so I'll boil it down to just a few key points that I think will be useful and then just put out there that I'm happy to talk in more detail uh, on, a, on a small group or individual basis if anyone has further questions or is, is really interested. Um, I think the first and, and most important thing that can be done is to just get exposed and engaged with an area that's of interest to you. Um, so it, it took me a long time to find psychology uh, and to find neuroscience. Up until that point, um, you know, I was, I was a good student, but I somewhat struggled to be that um, in typical STEM topics that I had learned at that point. So chemistry, I was okay. Uh, I understood it, but it was hard. Physics was kind of the same way. I, I understood it. Um, I could, you know, perform pretty well on exams, but it wasn't my passion. Um, it didn't excite me. And then I got to college and, and took these first few classes and it was like a light bulb went off. It was just so engaging. It was so exciting to be a part of that process and learning those areas. And I now dedicated my life to try and understand how the brain works uh, so, that, so that we can advance uh, advanced treatments for people suffering from neurological diseases so that we can better understand how we, how we are. Um, and so I would say as early as you can, if you think something would be interesting, try and find ways that you can connect with that information. So whether it's a YouTube video or a workshop or a class, um, I highly encourage taking a look at press releases about innovations and discoveries in a field. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'll tell you a little known secret is that there are, there are papers that all scientists publish that detail the results of their studies. And you can absolutely gain access to these papers. Now, sometimes they're published in journals that have a paywall, but right at the first page, you can go and find the email of the author that produce that work and you can email them and ask them questions. And I would say 99 out of 100 scientists are generally pleased to get an email from somebody interested in their work and would be happy to talk more. So I encourage you to engage content that you find interesting. And then you mentioned mentors. 
Mentors are absolutely key. You want to expand that network and get involved with people who are interested in the same things you are uh, as quickly as you can. So reach out, look, look at your local university and see on the faculty websites who is working there and what are they studying. And if there's an area that's interesting to you, send them an email. Ask them if you can talk more with them about their career and how they got there. Um, and so work, work on work on leveraging your network to get you where you want to go and getting mentors to help you along the way. Fantastic. Um, I definitely think, you know, having people on your side and talking to folks in careers or fields that you want to go into is very important. Um, so thank you for opening yourself up to, to be uh, that for somebody else. Um, I do know that you have a young daughter and I was just curious to know, uh, is she looking forward to a career in STEM in her future? Uh, yeah, I do. I do have a young daughter. Her name's Isabella. Uh, she is, she's great. Um, and, you know, I think she's still finding herself and we are absolutely uh, in support of her exploring lots of careers. So when she was much younger, she uh, said that she wanted to be a doctor scientist like mommy, which is great. I'm happy that, I'm happy that she was interested in that. Uh, because certainly there were not very many people in my family who had achieved a, a doctorate level education. Um, and then when she was about five, she wanted to be an artist. And for about a year, she was excited in art. And so we got her some art lessons and, and gave her some art supplies. And she explored that possibility as well. And then just a few months ago, she said she was interested in dentistry. And uh, we said, okay. Here's, here's a couple resources to learn more about, about that job. And, and so I think whatever she decides on, uh, we will be very proud of her and we will support her in achieving her goals, whatever those may be. Um, but, but yeah, I'd love to have, I'd love to have Dr. Bella alongside me working in my lab. That'd be great. For sure. That is fantastic. Um, I love to hear that, you know, of course, you as a scientist encourage science and STEM inside your household with her, but um, also that you are just supportive of whatever whatever life takes her to. Um, and I'm sure she'll be fantastic because she has a fantastic role model every day for her. So um, that's great. Um, I don't think we have any questions right now, um, but I wanted to know um, if you have any last words or um, any wisdom or a little piece of advice that you want to share for, with the folks watching today? Sure. I would say that um, if, this is, if this is a career you're thinking about, um, I think I've reiterated several times, it's, it's absolutely key to get mentoring along that, along that path. It's, it's a long career path. Uh, I will be very real that uh, it takes many years of school. We joke that uh, I'm in 20, or I, I graduated from 22nd grade by the time I got my doctorate. Um, and so there's, there's a lot of education and a lot of training because this is a, this is a challenging career. Um, and I I'm, I'm don't wanna sugarcoat it. There, there are ups and downs, there are, you know, experiments that, that don't work out the way that you want to. Um, and there are challenges that you have to overcome. And, uh, you know, science, science has a lot of rejection inherently built in. And, and that's important because we want to make sure that what we are producing is the truth. That's what we're seeking. And so you, you have to be able to take that rejection along the way. So I would say, it, it, my advice is, you shouldn't do that alone. Um, that is not something that any one person should have to carry the burden of. And so at every step, find somebody who's, who's navigated that, that path before you. So if you're in high school, try and connect with some college students who are studying what you want to study and ask them how they got to where they are. And then look at the next step. How did, how did students get into graduate school? What were the things that they did that they found helped them be successful in, in getting to that place. Once you're in graduate school, start talking to faculty members or people even outside of academia who are using their PhDs for things that aren't you know, actually working in the lab because there's all kinds of career possibilities that use a PhD uh, level training 
but don't involve working at a university. And, and I want to encourage thinking broadly about what a PhD can do for you, um, if that's the route that you go. So absolutely get help uh, and, and find allies along the way because they will, they will help pull you along when things get hard. Oh, I think that's amazing advice. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Liz, today for everything you've told us today. Thank you for showing us your lab. Thank you for giving us a little taste of uh, what your work day is like. Um, and I will for sure be awaiting to see some results from your studies in the future. Um, so thank you again for joining us today. Thanks so much for having me. Yeah, so uh, we hope everyone watching will join us every Wednesday from now through September 30th for more conversations in our Women in STEM speaker series. Uh, we have some very excited uh, folks that are lined up to uh, talk with some of us uh, later on in the series. Um, you can check out our website for more details and see a full list of those speakers. Our website is carnegiesciencecenter.org. Thanks everyone for watching.